Hello everybody, Chess Large here with another repair video for you and on the bench today we have something rather special. This is a Micro Vitek Cub Monitor. This is a classic 1980s monitor uh, that was um, used for lots of different uh, home computers, most especially the uh, BBC Micro, uh, of which I've got one upstairs and I will need to get it out. Um, pick this up rather cheaply actually uh, off of eBay so uh, quite grateful for that however it has got a fault which I happen to know is a common fault because I've fixed a few of these myself in the past so um, I've had, had to take the, the covers off just generally just to see make sure nothing was uh, going to burst into flames when I plugged it in and it isn't but I can show you this a particular fault let's just make sure it's switched off at the back okay so when i switch it on watch the screen light comes on the front and on the screen we have a white line across the middle and i'm going to switch it off before we damage the tube uh, the tube being a phosphor tube so if you lift that uh, image on there for too long you would actually burn the phosphors off the inside of the front of the tube that fault is technically known as frame collapse and um, frame collapse is when the scan coils that drive the scanning of the beam up and down stop working and on this particular uh, monitor um, there is a circuit that is provided with a supply rail and that supply rail is quite commonly faulty so let's have a little look inside <laughs> Okay, well I've taken the back cover off and the lid off of the uh, monitor so we can see a bit more inside. Let's have a look inside. Here we have uh, quite a clean uh, monitor. It's uh, obviously been kept in a, uh, a clean environment. Uh, it's a little bit dusty obviously, uh, but it is uh, clean. There's no mold, there's no uh, marks of condensation or anything on the inside, which is very, very useful. Now, the circuit that we're involved with finding the fault is on here. This is the full circuit diagram. Um, this is the circuit here, which is the frame time base. And there we have the frame coils and they're driven by this IC, which is the TDA 1170 in this uh, driver chip. And this is all supplied with supply voltage from here off the line output transformer uh, through a resistor, which is a, a 10 ohm fusible resistor effectively uh, through a diode and this provides a 24 volt output here um, to the uh, the frame time base now a common fault with these is this great big capacitor this thousand microfarad capacitor there uh, that goes short circuit drags down this frame time base voltage um, and so consequently we get no frame output so the easiest way to determine if this is faulty is to go to this uh, test point here or uh, this test link here TL201 and that TL201 is just there on the circuit you can just see it so if we get the uh, meter on there and have a look there we should be able to see it I've got it on ohms range and I'm going to go between chassis and that resistor well I'm going to just check make sure there's no voltages there first so let's go on to that link there and see the, the TV is turned, the, the monitor is actually turned off, so there's, I'm not uh, going anywhere near voltages at the minute. Always trying to do things cold if, necess if possible. So let's just go to ohms first, onto that link, and see what reading we get. Oh, look at that. Virtually a short circuit. So I'm pretty certain that that capacitor there has failed. The diode, uh, which is just here, um, which provides it uh, obviously there's a coil that goes down to ground from the other side so if we go on to um, that resistor there or that diode there and we can see yeah there's we, we've got 63k so uh, the diode isn't short circuit so it's not uh, going backwards is obviously the fault is uh, from this um, diode onwards going down to ground there's a, a circuit here, it goes through this coil and down through this transistor. It's unlikely that this transistor is at fault. Even if it was, it would go through a 180 ohm 1 watt resistor down to ground. 
So the reading we would expect to see there is 180 ohms. We've got 150 ohms there to somewhere else. Um, it's not going to go anywhere else that's going to take it down to ground. Um, this is the line output uh, drive stage. That's all working because we've got the line across. So I'm pretty certain that we're going to find that C224, that's this big beastie here, is short circuit. So we've got to get to that and see if we can get it out. Now the chassis on this comes out quite easily. It's all held in by plastic clips like this, either in each corner. But we need to beware that obviously it's been powered on. So there could be voltages, certainly over this side, which is the mains uh, switch mode power supply here. And there's a great big capacitor here that stores a lot of voltage. Hopefully by the time we get the chassis out, that will have discharged, but we better be sure anyway. Um, just out of interest, this particular model of uh, this monitor is a model number um, 1436MR4 and it's a, a later model and it's got this circuit board here which m modifies the video input from this socket here. Uh, that goes into here and then it's modified and the output from there goes down to the main video input um, on the board. And this particular one is modified specifically for taking an input from an Apple II computer. So uh, I haven't got an Apple II computer, so I can't test that. But I have got a BBC Micro, and the default on this is for the BBC Micro. So what we should be able to do is unplug this connector here and plug it straight into this one here. Um, so therefore bypassing this board, and we should then be able to see a picture generated by the BBC Micro once we've got the frame back up. Um, we can also apply volt, um, <clears throat> test signals from a signal generator. And I've actually got a signal generator which should do the job as well. But we'll come to that when we've actually got the circuit board out. May have to unplug various bits and pieces to get there. Um, but uh, hopefully trying to unplug as little as possible. Uh, if you ever have to work on a CRT monitor, the biggest thing to be careful of is both high voltage on this anode cap here, which is about 10,000 volts, very low current, uh, but it's enough to give you a really nasty whack. Uh, but also on the end of the tube here, um, this is a very vulnerable point. So it's very easy uh, for uh, a mishandling to knock the end of the tube off, therefore not avoiding the whole damn thing. You, you basically, you're not gonna get one of these tubes unless you buy some old uh, monitor and, and take the tube out of it. So pl be very, very careful with that. We may have to um, pull that um, connector off there to get that out. Um, the other thing to just also be careful of if you're working with these monitors are these rings. These are magnets and they're uh, stuck together. These do the convergence of the three uh, color beams onto the tube. Um, in the old days, you had lots of extra windings and circuits, trapezoid circuits and that to generate different voltages. In these later tube models, it was all done by these fixed magnets and that's stuck in that position. So if you do ever have to um, work around a monitor like this, do please try not to damage or, or move these rings because getting the convergence back into the right position, that's the position of the beam hitting the right dots on the screen in the right corners, etc., is very, very difficult to do unless you really are experienced something I haven't had to do for at least 30 years. Right, let's get this board out. First off, we're unplugged. I can't honestly remember the last time I did one of these, which way was the best way to get it out. But I think I'm going to have to disconnect this connector down here first off, which is the degaussing circuit. Um, for anyone, uh, sorry, no, that's the uh, front display light and the degaussing circuit there. So the degaussing circuit is um, basically this coil which wraps around the outside of the uh, tube. And what that does is when you switch it on, this little device down here, this black device down here is called a positor, uh, together with this one, a veractor. Um, they generate a sur surge voltage around here to remove any extraneous magnetic um, influences. Um, so uh, generally speaking, they're pretty reliable, but if you ever get a one of these monitors 
and you get lots of blotchy colours all over, it could well be that the degaussing circuit isn't working. So we just need to unplug those two. Triple checking we are unplugged. Um, the plug comes out, we've got a little actual tag there. It's not meant to be used for pulling it out, but it, it does actually work as that. So that comes out. And then, as I always say, never pull the wires, always pull the plug. So we should be able to pull that plug out there. Um, let's take this board off the back. Pretty sure we have to get this out to get this board out. And it will make it a lot easier, I think, to work on if we actually can take the board right out. And then this one also should, well, this is the main input. Like so, and that gives us a lot more clearance. Um, I think I'll just remove that shielding that as well just so we can get that out of the way right so that's the whole of the rear panel out of the way makes life a lot easier and we've got a bit more space on the bench to move things about Let's get this connector off the bottom here. That should tap out the way there. Alright, so we've got one clip, two clips. Three clips and the fourth one there. I'm pretty sure that's oh no, we've got one here at the back as well. That's it. I don't know why since I did one of these. Come on my beauty. Right, so having got the board to that position, we should now be able to flip it on its side. Like so. So we can see the underside of the board. Get the camera in the right place. Okay, so we've got the um, circuit board now into a position where we can work on it and we should be able to desolder this capacitor here, uh, these two points. So uh, just to make it very quick and easy, what I don't want to do is I don't want to overheat that capacitor um, too much uh, because it, it could remove the short circuit that um, is on that um, uh, capacitor and therefore uh, we lose the fault that we've proved. So what I'm going to do is uh, see if I can grab it, uh, desolder it very quickly with my desolder sucker. So let's just clean the solder and I give it a little bit of tinning. So Okay, so that should have released the capacitor enough to just wiggle it out. So there we are. Remove the capacitor. 
and we shall put the meter across it and we should see a short circuit across this capacitor there we go dead short capacitor there's our fault there is your fault so that's a thousand mic at 40 volts pretty sure i've got some of those right well i'm going to run the risk of five volts because all i've got at the moment is a thousand mic at 35 volts there so i'm going to pop that in and hopefully that will resolve the issue but i shall get some thousand mics at 40 volts on order well might as well order i say some because might as well order um two or three because you never know you might get another one of these in so the capacitor goes in there and the positive side let's just double check that with a moon go to ground and that's ground on there sure enough yeah so the negative side is there plus the fact there's a plus sign mentioned on there just didn't quite clear that hole so there we have a capacitor in place just a slight little bend on the legs just to hold it in place Fold it in. Snip the legs. Always save the little bits of wire that you cut off because you never know. They, they come in handy for doing little repair things. I've got a little tray there that I keep them in. Okie dokie dokie. So now very carefully we are turning the chassis back over. This circuit board. Put it so far and just plug those connectors back in. That one. up slightly in the circuit board Get the plastic lugs in place plug in there right I'm just going to pop this connector from the video modifier board on there. Let's get the back panel. Make sure a good chassis connection. I won't bother with these video connectors. All we want now is the mains input. Triple check we've put it all back in. Not pulled any other wires off. I still switched off at the mains. Let's turn it round so we can see with this camera. So hopefully when we switch it on now, we should get oh nice little PHT zip. We should now get a full scan image, hopefully. Well, I can certainly feel EHT on the back of my hand, and we've still got Frank up. Okie dokie. Right, well, although we've changed that capacitor, we still have frame caps. 
That's a shame. I thought we were going to fix it. But we might have taken something out. So let's just put this on here and check the supply voltage. Right, I'm just going to put my probe in here and clip it onto, if I can, onto that test point. So, if the capacitor is okay, we should see, oh, 400 millivolts. That's not enough to feed the frame time base. Hmm. Okay, let's turn it off. I'm just going to, I'm not going to flick it past things, but I just want to just double check. Alright, so we've got nearly 1k on that test point there less than 1k is about about right for this particular point so why haven't we got any voltage there have we done has that resistor failed i dare say uh, 235 has actually failed because of the short circuit so let's see if we can get our meter probe across there. So we're going to try and get to read R235, which is just down there. So we can get there. There it is. So that's that resistor there. So that should be 10 ohms. I suppose really we should have expected that to fail. There's one side, there's the other side, and it's really about 35 mega ohms. Yeah, that 10 ohm resistor has failed, that's why we've got no supply voltage. So, get the chassis out once more. I'll cut back when we've uh, done that. Okay, so I've replaced the resistor as I uh, spotted earlier with a new uh, resistor, a 10 ohm uh, fusible type, and check the rest of the circuit. So hopefully uh, we should now be able to see a picture when we turn the TV on, the monitor on. Keep calling things TVs, because that's what I use to fix TVs. So let's have a look. We're powered on. I can feel the static on the display. Hey, look at that. Oh, let's turn the contrast down. Right. So we have what we call in the in the trade a raster. So the frame time base is now working again. We won't know for sure whether we've actually got uh, the correct geometry and so on until we get a test signal into there. So that's the next thing that I'll be doing is putting a test signal into it. It's flickering a bit because um, the camera, although the camera is set for 50 hertz and this is running at 50 hertz on the screen, I can see the screen is not flickering, but the camera can. So the camera is not uh, the best camera in the world. But there we are. Right. So uh, on to generating a test signal for it. Right. Well, it's uh, been a while. I've uh, spent quite a bit of time making a special lead uh, for the video input on this micro iTech monitor. Um, and basically uh, the reason I've done that is because I've got a color bar generator here which I've used for many years for doing uh, TV repairs but uh, luckily on the back of here we've got uh, TTL um, and RGB level outputs uh, which I, I'm going to use to test and see if uh, we get a image on this uh, monitor. Now I've made the cable up to fit and uh, correspond to the um, the connections on the back so let's switch the monitor back on and we hear it start up and we'll just wait for the raster to build up so we should get a white screen as we had before might have turned the contrast down let me just turn that up Oop, nothing yet maybe because we've got i've plugged this already in 
So let's turn the colour bar generator on and see. Aha! Yes, we have. So let's turn the contrast back up. Yeah, presumably, I think, if, if we don't have a video input, yes, we get uh, a blank white raster. I hadn't realised that. So let's plug the connector back in on the back there. And we've got some lovely colour bars. Now, uh, you may not be able to see it as clearly as I can. I've got a lot of uh, overhead reflections. So let me just turn the light out here. That makes life a little bit better. But uh, we definitely have got white, yellow, cyan, green, magenta, red, blue, black on this monitor. I don't know whether this uh, camera is particularly colorblind or what, I don't know. Well, I'll have to look see what it's like on video. But anyway, we've also got uh, various test patterns. So we can have a blank white raster, so we can have a blue raster, or green, or red. Put the three together and we get a white raster. And we can also have uh, dots on the screen and a crosshatch. And the crosshatch is what we use to judge how well the convergence uh, of the beams is on the screen. And we've just got a slight little bit of misconvergence up in this top left hand corner. A little bit more in the top right as well. But otherwise it looks nice and square as I think you can agree. Um, we can do horizontal lines and vertical lines. So all in all, I think we've actually got ourselves a good working monitor, uh, which I'm very pleased with. So those are just the dots and the focus bars. So let's just go back to the color bars, which I'm very happy with. Okay, so it's definitely uh, on the screen, on my screen I'm looking at through the camera, it doesn't show the green um, or the cyan. The yellow is a bit browny. Uh, that may be just down to the output of this device. Uh, it's not been used for RGB output for a while, but so uh, that may be the reason for it. But anyway, uh, I'm pretty sure that that's good. So the next stage would be to get hold of the old uh, BBC Micro, uh, get that out and connect it up and make sure that works okay as well. So back after I get that out of the little storage area. Okay, so we're back with this monitor and I made another special lead to connect the BBC Micro which I've dug out of the storage area and connected it all up. Now's the time to see if it works with the monitor. Oh, there we have a display on the monitor. Let me just turn the light off because it's a, a bit glary with that computer. We can just about see it there. Uh, but if I, uh, I've put a disc in the drive which I'm pretty sure this disc works so let me just do a shift break to reboot it oh and it's this disc from the Open University the educational computing area um, can't really see it all that well as I said with the let's turn the lights out again um, and let's just see what um, yeah let's go service I seem to remember that being a bit of an uh, animated thing um, not quite sure how we did this half a run oh yeah there we are and it's a little bit of an animation um, counting people coming into a, um, a service center or something like that I don't know I can't remember but anyway it shows that the uh, screen is working colors are correct and it's working fine for the BBC Micro. There's a little bit of a vertical bounce. That may be that one of the uh, one of the links inside the monitor that I've had to change to get it to work with the BBC because this monitor was set up for an Apple II input as opposed to a BBC input. But uh, going by the manual, I've, I've moved the links around. I think there's one link that I may not have moved in the right place or whatever. But anyway, it's working. That's the main thing. So... I think we can pretty much say that this is now uh, an okay repair and uh, I'm quite happy with that. So thanks very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, as everybody else says, please like and subscribe if you really enjoy this. Um, and uh, I'll see if I can do some more videos in the near future with some other repairs I've got pending. Thanks very much. Cheerio.